Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual Patroon Lunch featuring Dr. John Waldman. We are excited to have all of you here today and to learn the latest from John on dam removals in the Northeast. As most of you know, these events are sponsored by the Founding Fish Network and the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Uh, prior to COVID, these lunches were held at Aretsky's Patroon Restaurant in New York, and we hope to host in-person events again soon. However, in the meantime, we are glad to be able to share expert insights via webinar to folks across the country. If you or someone you know wants to be more involved with our efforts, please reach out to me at bensonchiles at gmail.com. Thanks again to all of you for joining. <clears throat> Dr. Waldman is a faculty member at uh, Queens College and the author of dozens of scientific papers and books on anadromous species. His bio was included with the invitation, so I will not recount all of his impressive credentials here. I will only say that we invited John to speak for three reasons. One, he has an academic interest in anadromous forage species, uh, which is an issue near and dear to many of our hearts. Uh, two, he has a real world interest in helping these anadromous populations recover. So his finger is on the pulse of what's going on with dam removals throughout the region. And for those of uh, you who wanna roll up their sleeves to help out, John can point us in the right direction. And I should note, uh, we're lucky to have other experts on this call as well, including George Jackman of Riverkeeper. And, but the third and perhaps most important reason we invited John to speak today is that he is an avid striped bass fisherman. At the end of this talk, I will ask John where we can find the hottest East Coast striped bass fishing this year so stick around for what I'm guessing will be a somewhat surprising answer to most of you. So uh, welcome, John. Thank you for joining us. John's going to do a presentation right now. And then at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and we'll have a discussion for the final 20 minutes of the hour that we have together. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat function, and, and you can do that at any time during, during the presentation. So, John, thanks again for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Benson, for that kind introduction, and uh, it's a privilege to speak about a subject that I'm quite passionate about. So let me share this. Uh, so those damn dams. Um, this is an uh, image of the Malison River um, dam that... Uh, is highly problematic that I'll talk about a little later. And these are the species of primary concern. There are reasons to take dams down for the resident species in rivers, but these are the famous diadromous fish that move between fresh and salt water. And we have about a dozen species in the Northeast, more than anywhere else in the world. And they're a very unique set of species because there are over 20,000 kinds of fish on the planet and only about 200 of them um, have this kind of life history cycle. So it, it's kind of unique and it's spread very widely across their uh, evolutionary history. You have species as primitive as lamprey and as advanced as striped bass and that's not a value judgment, that's just um, the pattern of evolutionary diversification. I'm gonna focus mainly on uh, the river herring, ale, alewife and um, blueback herring because they are ubiquitous in this area and they also are a, um, an adromous baitfish species. And the shad, the American shad, because the shad is a, a great kind of emblematic species. If shad can make it to their spawning areas and rivers, pretty much everything else follows. So they're a good species to track. And these species are truly iconic. This is a, uh, a lithograph from 1886 from the Hudson by Lossing. And it shows three fish next to a commercial fishing operation. And it's not a coincidence that they're all uh, anadromous. These are the fish that are born in rivers, go to the sea and fatten up on almost unlimited um, food resources and then deliver it back very reliably in the spring. And they were the you know, backbone of European colonization and a large part of Native American diets too. 
And uh, I, I like this particular postcard because I think it encapsulates so much of the overall problem with managing um, anadromous fish these days. This is a postcard I found in an antique shop in Cape Cod, and it shows a little river in Cape Cod. They're all little there, and they're all either named uh, the Mill River or the Herring River for the most part. It just seems that uh, it kind of like divides between the two uses of these rivers for human uh, needs. And what's interesting about this is that it shows the immense possibilities and the immense vulnerability of these fish. This is a stream that's been co-opted basically to provide river herring um, to the market. And you see the barrels here um, ready to go with herring that are netted in this pool right here at the head of the stream. And above this is a dam with a lake where the fish need to spawn. And um, if you let these fish through, you can have a sustainable fishery forever. And if you don't, um, you will crash the fishery. And the thing about this is the, the sheer predictability of it. You know, you know that based on past experience, they're not gonna come here in January. They're not gonna come here in August. They're gonna come over the range of a few dates, let's say in late March. And, and you have this enormous control over the population. If you handle it right and let enough fish come through, let's say for three days a week, um, you can have this fishery forever. And if not, um, it crashes. And if you were looking for these same fish the rest of the year out of the open ocean, you, you would never find them. And yet they come walking into our laps. So this is a, a microcosm of, of what we have um, in terms of our control over rivers in general. It's just all shown in this one image very nicely. And in working on my book, Running Silver, I was really interested in the impressions of um, early colonists. And I found quotes that were pretty remarkable, um, you know, given what we see today in our rivers. Uh, these are just a few of them, but uh, to give you a taste, the alewives came up, the fresh rivers to spawn in such multitudes, it is almost incredible. Um, pressing up in such shallow waters, it will, it will scarce permit them to swim. Another one in, from 1616, they came in such abundance as is incredible. And my all-time favorite is the one by William Byrd from 1728. Uh, in a word, it is unbelievable, indeed, undescribable, as also incomprehensible what quantity is found there. One must behold oneself. I don't know how many fish were there, but he was awfully impressed. And he was impressed partly because he's coming from a continent in Europe that had been overfished and overtimbered and over everything for, for many centuries. So Europeans had no sense of what pristine fish runs and pristine habitats look like anymore. I know that Native Americans were taking some of these fish, but they did not have the kinds of effects that Europeans had later on. And uh, in going back to the river herring I mentioned earlier, they are not in good shape these days, although there is some reason for hope. This is a uh, plot not to be proud of that shows um, the commercial landings of American shad in uh, this blue line and river herring in the solid um, configuration here. And just from 1950 to the present, you can see that it's been an incredibly steep decline. And if you look at these fish, which have been described as the passenger pigeons of the sea, which it's a double-edged sword because we know passenger pigeons were enormous as can be, maybe the world's most numerous bird, but they're not here anymore. Uh, you see that the effect has been that in states that had long-term fisheries like uh, Massachusetts, there was a total closure in 2005, Rhode Island in 2006, Connecticut near total, New York reduced in the Hudson and closed elsewhere. So they're not doing very well. And uh, in, in researching the history of these fish, I found an unexpected source in, in Henry David Thoreau, who's uh, more famous for a book he wrote about a certain pond in Massachusetts, but he wrote a, a lovely book called A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers. And uh, it was published in 1849, self-published, but it was based on a trip he made 10 years earlier with his brother. And he paddled up and down the Concord of Merrimack Rivers at a time when these areas were being ramped up for industrialization and a time when people were excited about um, American progress. And what he saw from location to location was just doom for the fish. And there's, he issued quote after quote, basically saying that these fish did not have a chance. And my, my favorite among his many quotes was uh, actually very plaintive. He asked, who hears the fishes when they cry? Uh, and this is what happened to the Merrimack. This, this, this lovely, produce, very productive river 
uh, at a location called Amaskeag, which is where Native Americans went to, to capture migratory fish that were slowed down by a, a cataract, uh, it became completely commodified for industrial mills. Some of these mills were just tremendous, um, the size of football fields. And uh, the river drove, drove the industry and the river was given over to um, industry. And today it's, it's interesting to go there. Um, a lot of those mills have been turned into uh, residences. It's no longer an industrial hub. And there's a visitor center that invites you to celebrate the magic of the Merrimack. And in theory, you can go there and watch fish go up this fish ladder by standing on this side of this window. But in most years, they see anywhere from zero to maybe a few dozen fish. And the one reliable fish they'll see is the uh, fiberglass shad at the top of the, uh, the signage. So, um, and this is sort of <clears throat> typical of what's happened to many of our, our shad runs. So what's changed since those times? Um, I worked with a colleague at SUNY ESF, Karin Lindberg, to write a paper looking at the status of these fish. And uh, we tried to look at size. <clears throat> and size has very poor data over the course of time. We know that sturgeon grew very large. This is a uh, somewhat embellished image of Atlantic sturgeon um, being landed in the Hudson River. And we know that sturgeon got very large. They reached 800 pounds and 14 feet. Uh, and interestingly, they're still out there because some remote sensing a couple of years ago in the Hudson showed a school of sturgeon with one of them at 14 feet long. So it's kind of nice to know those dinosaurs are still swimming past Manhattan. But uh, in terms of actual data, the only data I could find comparing uh, size over time was interestingly from John McPhee's wonderful book about shad called The Founding Fish, where he said that in the Delaware River, uh, shad packed 40 to the barrel in 1800 and 100 to the same size barrel in 1900. So there had been a diminution in size. And uh, we, we think this is happening for a number of species. Striped bass were actually caught as large as 125 pounds uh, off North Carolina in the 1800s, but the world's record today is in the 80s. We also looked at population persistence and extirpation, and we found that um, there were 22 species that were found in Europe alone, North America alone, or both, and about half of them had insufficient data because they weren't high value species. But we found for, for species that we care about a lot that American shad lost half of their populations and North American Atlantic salmon populations had about a third of them extirpated. But the real kind of poster image for this problem is, is um, the metric of abundance. And this was a plot we created where we took data and standardized it from a scale of zero to one for Europe on the right side and um, North America on the left panel. And what you see in case after case after case is this zooming down to the, uh, to the asymptote, you know, to the x-axis where populations either were extirpated or more often existed in relic levels. And uh, we found that for 31 time series that there was a 98% decline from historic highs in 13 and 90% in an in additional 11. And the one exception is striped bass, because striped bass basically had one driver that was really controlling their numbers, and that was overfishing. And once overfishing was tamped down, the fish came back in a nice way, although right now I'm not so happy with their status. Uh, but the others have multiple drivers, and it's very hard to solve the conservation when you have so many drivers. And I'll talk more about the drivers in a moment. So looking at some case histories, if we take, for instance, changes in abundance of Atlantic salmon, uh, my friends at the Atlantic Salmon Federation estimate that in the US alone, uh, originally we had 300,000 to, to half a million that ran up our rivers annually, all the way down to the Usatonic River here, not far from um, where many of us are right now. And that number fell to less than 400 in 2014. Um, it's good to know that it's bounced back over a thousand, but it's still orders of magnitude lower than where it had been originally. And these fish are now federally endangered in Gulf of Maine rivers. Another species that I, I kept close track on is American shad. And uh, a colleague of mine estimated how much um, river habitat they had lost along the East Coast. This is an original map of the East Coast. And you can see how far these fish went way up into the uh, foothills of the Appalachians before there were dams. And uh, my colleague believes that we've lost about 40% of 
of that habitat, which is pretty major. And, and one case history that I found uh, just very saddening was that of the Susquehanna River Shad. Uh, shad used to run up Chesapeake Bay and into both branches of the Susquehanna. And on the north branch, they would go as far as Lake Otsego at Cooperstown. And uh, the fish ran in enormous numbers. They were a big part of the, uh, the food sources and, 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 and cultural traditions of the Susquehanna Valley. This is a, a shad bake going on uh, in the Susquehanna. And this was done in the Hudson too and other rivers also. And it was a celebration of spring, a revival. All of a sudden you had food uh, available in seemingly endless quantities. And they would roast the shad um, fillets against coals and, and have basically a giant town party. And these were the kinds of catches that were made in those days. This was a catch being landed somewhere in the Susquehanna. And the fish ran in these incredible numbers, probably in the tens of millions. There was one fishery where they would post the sentry on a hill with a watch glass, and he could actually see the water bulge as the schools of shad went up river. And uh, there was another fishery near the, uh, the mouth of the river where they set this giant net one day when there was a strong northwest wind blowing, and it filled up with fish, and they could not get it in for two days. And when they finally got it in, they had an estimated 15 million herring and, and shad in one haul. Compare that to today. Now we have four dams on the lower Susquehanna and um, the spawning area is up here above the four dams. And the four dams are hydro dams, of course. And one thing about these dams is that these hydro dams do allow you to count every individual that passes them because they have some kind of facility, a fish ladder or a fish elevator where counting is possible. So we know how many are making it. And the target for uh, return of the, Hudson, of the uh, Susquehanna River shed is three quarters of a million, which is not ambitious compared to what we believe was there originally. But in, in recent years, the counts have been abysmal. Um, the first dam at Conowingo in 2014, and this is just one year for example, but the other years are similar. Uh, we had about 10,000 fish pass that first dam. Then about 2,500 make it past the second about 1,300 make it past the third, and eight, eight fish made it past the fourth dam. Some years it's zero. Try to uh, have the water bulge from eight fish or have them recover. It's, it's not working, and it's not working for a number of reasons. And I think part of the problem is just the societal interest in this. You know, I think if, um, I, I consider this to be one of the U.S.'s most, um, profound conservation failures. And if this was with birds where they were visible in the air, if you put a giant wall up in the air and birds were bouncing off it, people would be screaming. But what happens with these fish happens underwater. And because of that, the numbers of people who are really concerned are far less. But it does raise the question of our own perceptions of how things have changed. And uh, this brings up the shifting baseline syndrome, which I think is relevant to many aspects of conservation in this country. And this, this was uh, a term that was brought to light by Daniel Pauly in 95. He's a very excellent fish scientist. And he wrote that each generation of fishery scientists accepts as a baseline the stock size that occurred at the beginning of their careers and uses this to evaluate changes. When the next generation starts its career, the stocks have further declined, but it is the stocks at that time that serve as a new baseline. So basically he's describing kind of a societal ratchet that lowers our expectations. And it's important for that reason to keep diving into historical ecology to really unearth what it is we had and also to inspire uh, recovery in that direction. So here's an example of uh, the value of historical ecology. This is um, the trend of commercial landings of American shad in the Potomac River from 1887 to about a little past the year 2000. And it's a sad, a sad decline. If you draw a line here, obviously we're heading down to almost zero. But fix your eyes on 1887 now and go back deeper in history. 1887 is here. This is 1814. 1887, which we would view as a great year based on that previous graph, was already far, far, far lower than what this river was capable of producing. And for that reason, I, I think that, um, that history is an important part of conservation. So what can be done about this? Um, I recently published a paper in, in Science Advances where I put 
the drivers of decline into bins. And uh, just want to go through these very quickly. Uh, there are drivers that are largely rectified. Pollution is a mostly solved problem. I know there's an occasional spill of some kind. I know there's lingering PCBs in, in, in Hudson River fish and other, other rivers too. But overall, pollution is not limiting the recovery of these fish. And in fact, the Hudson in its worst polluted days actually had very large runs of fish. Um, so pollution to me is, is, is maybe a little bit exaggerated in terms of its effect. Then we have drivers that are tractable and mostly applied already. Overfishing has been a huge problem over time, but it's also the most easily solved conceptually because basically it means, okay, catch fewer fish and you can allow them to come back. Uh, because of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, guiding the uh, management of these fish, we're doing much better overfishing. We are still having some cases of overfishing. I would say striped bass fall into that category right now. But um, overfishing has been largely uh, uh, solved, I would say. And power plants actually take in vast numbers of uh, eggs and larvae and, and do some serious damage to uh, populations in some rivers like the Hudson. So they're very species selective. Certain species like sturgeon and uh, striped bass never use them. And they don't work very well for shad because they're too small for the most part to make this big water fish comfortable. They do work well in some cases in river herring, but they are um, best used for very small dams in certain situations and dam removal is still a preferred option. Uh, on Now, I'm, okay, on larger dams that are too tall for fish ladders, there may be fish elevators. Uh, fish elevators work by having an attraction flow that draws the fish to that, that site because as they swim around below the dam, kind of confused, they're attracted to that flow. And uh, they then go into a, a hopper and are sent up to the penthouse level up here where they can then swim into the reservoir. And a third option, which I find very sad is uh, what I call migration via the internal combustion engine where fish are trucked past dams. And uh, that's kind of a triage situation, but um, it actually sometimes works better than the, uh, the engineered fish ways because the fish get the pain over with in an hour and they don't have to spend days and days trying to figure out uh, how to get up these very foreign um, contraptions. So, in, in looking at um, the success of these runs, uh, my colleagues and I published a paper where we took data from three major Northeastern rivers. And we looked at the numbers of fish that went from the first to the second dam, and then the, uh, from the first to the last dam, which is what they need to do to get to their spawning areas. And, um, and again, this is because you can count the fish. All these, all these dams have facilities for counting. And you can see that the percentage of fish that actually made it to the second dam, in most cases, was well below 20%, um, bounced around in the Susquehanna. And the numbers that made it to where they need to go, um, to the last dam, was essentially flatlined near zero. So the idea that this kind of remedy of fish passage, um, engineered fish passage on dams, is taking care of business is just 100% wrong. So there is a great Atlantic Coast precedent for removing dams, and that's the uh, removal of Edwards Dam on the Kennebec near Augusta, Maine in 1999. This was written uh, about uh, quite nicely by, by John McPhee in his founding fish book. And this dam blocked fish from getting past this dam for 162 years. It produced very little power. McPhee said basically enough to power the, uh, you know, maybe a warehouse, the Dean Warehouse in, in, in Maine. And, uh, it was taken down, uh, the Federal Energy and Regulatory Commission agreed that it wasn't worth keeping, uh, even though they're very um, industry friendly because it was producing essentially three megawatts, which is very little. And they opened up the, uh, the dam and very quickly, fish colonized the next 17 miles of river up to the next dams, but it gave them access to the Sebastocook River, which is a slow moving tributary that is a river herring Shangri-La. And that run in that one little tributary alone went from zero before the dam was breached to 6 million in the course of several years. And it's become really important to the state of Maine. Lobster fishermen come from far away to gather bait. It provides a lot of um, um, bait fish for 
game fish like striped bass. It's feeding about 60 eagles that nest around it. And uh, it's so popular that the local community started their own annual river herring festival. So the thing about these dams too is that beyond the ecological issues, they don't last forever. You know, you look at a dam and you think, well, it's, a, it's a, this big concrete monolith. It'll be like the Sphinx, you know, in Egypt and be there for, for generations and generations. But they're built with the idea of about a hundred year lifespan. And I, <clears throat> I'm not an engineer, but I've toured a lot of New England dams. And I could say a lot of them are scary. They look decrepit to me. Um, and they're being challenged more by, by greater uh, punctuated and heavier rainfalls that are uh, part of the, uh, the climate change effect. So we're seeing dams fail, like in South Carolina several years ago, where about 20 dams broke and about 20 people died. And this will be happening more. So we have an opportunity to combine the ecological problems with the uh, basic safety aspect. When we look at the pattern of uh, US dam construction and removals, we see that um, very gladly, the numbers of dams being built per year have gone down to very low levels in the entire United States. Um, it's a rarity now to build a dam uh, and the uh, number of removals is going up. This is uh, broken up into large and small dams here, but you can see on, in 10 year bins from 1915 to uh, almost the present that we are really ramping up our level of activity of taking down dams. But there are estimated to be about 80,000 to 100,000 dams in this country. And I think that's, that's low. Um, if you count small dams, it's, it's, it's higher. Uh, and there's about 2,600 hydro dams. So there was interest uh, when I was talking to some of the patroons about the cost of dam removals. And this is a very coarse estimate, but it's been estimated that um, you're looking at about 22,000 to 30,000 per, per vertical foot of height. And uh, again, that can vary tremendously. This is for the actual removal part of it, not for all the other costs. And the other costs can be considerable. You know, when you get to the point of actually bringing in heavy equipment, you've already used up a lot of NGO or agency staff time. You may have had hydrologists involved um, you may have had lawyers involved. There's a good chance that's the case. Um, you need engineers. Um, you have the heavy equipment cost itself, uh, and you have a waste disposal problem in some cases. You know, in many cases, you've you've accumulated sediments that have uh, industrial contaminants um, mixed with them, and in those cases, most states require you to actually get rid of that in some distant landfill rather than just sending it downstream. And finally, and this is important too, um, you want to monitor the results of the actual removal. So it's not inexpensive for larger dams. Smaller dams, you can almost take a jackhammer in some cases and, and crack them open. But larger dams, uh, it's quite an involved process. And uh, you know, is it worth it? Well, it's worth it ecologically. But also, I found one nice comparison. It's a little dated from 98 uh, for the costs of removal versus repair. And this is from Wisconsin. And you can see that the multiples are, are pretty much in favor of removal, just from a financial point of view, that uh, repair often costs three or four times more than, uh, than removal. So one concept I've been playing with and I've been trying to advance and I'm looking for the right situation for is what I call the shared river concept, the idea of sharing a river more completely between um, the fish and the ecology and um, energy production. So if you were to breach a dam, this is a dam here that's now been breached, all of a sudden the fish of course have access to the river, which is what you want, but you've also gained back some real estate because you've drained the reservoir. And theoretically you could put uh, solar panels all over the bottom. You also could put floating uh, solar in, in calm water locations and floating solar has been working very well in, in Eastern Asia. You also could capture some of the energy of the river with, with turbines on the bottom that don't actually block the entire river. And finally, because reservoirs are typically sited in locations with hills around them uh, to form the basin, you could put uh, wind power. So in the end, you could have an energy park that combines all these sources and then has the considerable advantage of the fact that you already have transmission lines that took the hydropower away. And that's a costly 
um, component of any kind of, uh, of energy production. So you could have a more resilient and more productive energy park uh, for not a vast amount of money. So how can you help? I've been asked this by, by people interested in funding um, dam removals. And I think there's two basic ways. One way I would call horizontally, which would be to fund NGOs like Hudson Riverkeeper, other river keepers and American rivers. And that has the advantage of uh, helping them do something that they're already very good at. They are doing this you know, routinely and uh, they, need, they need support. The disadvantage, of course, if you want to see exactly where your money did good, it's harder to track. An alternative is to look at helping vertically where you adopt and fund one or more rivers or dams and support the removal process. And that has its issues too in that uh, a dam removal process may take five or 10 years or even longer in terms of negotiating with the people who own uh, the dam, who own property behind the dam along the uh, shores of the pond, all the permitting. Um, so it's not that easy to do. I'm not saying it's impossible, but um, it's not without its challenges. There are some particularly dam dams in the region that I think you know, deserve attention by uh, people who want to help out. The Hudson has an estimated 1,600 dams in its valley. Um, Hudson Riverkeeper and George Jackman, who was mentioned earlier, are working on this along with New York State DEC. Uh, I think they have about 1,597 to go. So there's a huge amount of work to be done. One of them in particular has always attracted a lot of attention, the Eddyville Dam on the Rondout River. This is a dam that serves no purpose and that blocks seven miles of big river that might be suitable for um, shad. And it's rare to find a location where you could actually bring shad back to. Um, more locally uh, on, the, on Eastern Long Island, we have the Upper Mills Dam on the Peconic River. Uh, the Peconic River already has a nice run in part of it, but if we opened it up, it would be uh, just an amazingly large run. And it has this, this dam which has utility uh, pipelines running through it, which complicates things. And the uh, progress on getting it taken down and remediated has been stalled for a while. So there's another one where people could jump in. Uh, the Kesslin Dam on the Mousam River in Maine, this is a river where I actually fished uh, and uh, it, it has a, a small relic run of river herring and shad. It has a few sea run brown trout, beautiful water quality. It could be a magnificent uh, fish producing river, but it has three dams in a row that produce only one megawatt of power, which is nothing. It's just enough for a few toasters. Um, and it, again, it, it's, it's in the middle of a battle between the um, utility operator and, and a portion of the public. And one that I'm personally very involved with is the Kinneytown Dam on the Naugatuck River um, off Route 8 in Western Connecticut. This is a tributary of Usatonic. And this river has had five dams removed and one bypassed uh, over 32 miles. It's ready to explode with fish, but it has one dam which is falling apart. I mean, it is scary. Look at, look at this condition of this dam. Uh, but uh, there's a hydro company that owns it now that doesn't want to relinquish its rights to it. It produces less than one megawatt, uh, which is an infinitesimal amount for uh, Connecticut's needs. And uh, it's not easy to solve because it is a uh, FERC it's, it doesn't require a, uh, regular FERC licensing, which makes it uh, harder to get a grip on it. And there's a big coalition working on it. In fact, Senator Blumenthal has been down there a couple of times to, to support us. He's very much behind removing it. So another idea I just want to put out there, which uh, I think has a lot of potential is to develop what I call some running silver student courses. And the charge to the students would be to revision fish passage and uh, the fate of dams energy production, societal interactions, all to cultivate new ideas and conservation leaders. And the idea would be to have four or five carefully selected colleges that are near large rivers develop perhaps two semester courses that would include field trips, mapping, guest lectures, workshops, community outreach, visualizations of the concepts that they come up with, community surveys, um, and, and, uh, and so on and a final concluding conference. And also, and this is um, important, I hope this works. Oop, not working, I'm sorry about that. Uh, story maps, which are a, uh, 
a new way of presenting multimedia um, presentations about the story of a river. So it could involve drone shots of the river, um, various op-eds and essays written about it, data, descriptions of the history, and you work your way through it using these very various media feeds, and it's a very compelling way to actually tell the story of a river. And I like to see every river have um, story maps developed for it. I'm sorry it didn't work, but if you have the time and interest, just Google Kinneytown story map after we're done, and you will see a very compelling story being told. So to finish up, I think that uh, I always like Leopold's quote, that a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And I think that what I just presented tends otherwise big time. Um, and I, I love this image. It's a famous image from the West Coast from the Seattle area of a chum salmon crossing a flooded road. And it just shows you the sheer um, drive and imperative these fish have to get back to their uh, spawning areas to, to start in uh, their next generation. Basically, you know, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of the field of dreams. Here, if you take it down, they will come. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you so much, John. That was a great presentation. And uh, we have a lot of questions that are popping up right now. I'm going to just sort of go through uh, them in order. But um, for folks who want to ask questions, you can do that in the comment field. Um, if you really feel like you are uh, want your voice heard, raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, but let's start with some of the questions that we have here. Uh, this one goes back to earlier in your presentation. Um, it's from Michael Rich. How can science use as a fishery baseline as a, um, as a year in their career? Uh, that is seemingly off the charts crazy. Please explain how they can do that. I'm actually not quite understanding the question. Um, I think the question is the, the, the shifting baselines hmm. concept and scientists accepting the sort of baseline as their first year in, uh, in the role, in their science, scientist role. Um, how, how is it that that happens? I think because there is not that much, you know, I don't think Americans are great historians for the most part. And uh, I, I think that, and history is hard to get funded also. It's just not sexy. It's not, you know, it's not DNA. So uh, there are good environmental historians out there that are, are looking for funding to create environmental histories. And we need to have uh, a greater emphasis on understanding the histories of river bodies and other aspects of conservation in this country. Again, not because we're going to get back to that point. I don't think we're ever going to see shad running in the Potomac producing tens of millions of kilograms of, of harvest per year. It's out of the question. But it does show you that the potential was there and it inspires you to try harder. And I think that inspiration to try harder is absolutely key. You know, it's easy to coast. It's hard to, hard to really work hard uh, to reverse things. And I think that uh, I, I know a, a colleague of mine who was very involved with um, taking down the, the Edwards Dam told me that when he presents to the public a history of what their river used to produce, it just changes their minds about um, taking dams down. They, they see that you know, something, has, something magnificent has been lost. And uh, so it, it, again, just to finish up on that point, it's not an actual restoration target, but it is a force that helps us move backwards in the right direction. Thank you, John. And John, if you wanna click out of your uh, PowerPoint. Sure. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're you're welcome to leave it up if we need to pull it up. Um, I have a question from uh, Captain Paul Eidman, who um, asks, you mentioned overfishing, but hoping you will talk about the disposal of bycatch at sea from the Atlantic herring, mackerel, squid, and butterfish fisheries. Is it currently ongoing and uncounted, same as it ever was? As far as I know, there were, the, the bycatch is a problem. Um, you know, it's easier to monitor fisheries in a river where the fish that are in that river are from that particular population. When they go to sea, they mix with other populations and they mix with other species. So in the case of bycatch, 
people are catching other species that are targeted and having the river herring mixed in and, or shad mixed in in places where you don't want them mixed in. And you don't have a good accounting of how many you're taking. And it's also depressing those populations. So it's my understanding that there was some study of this done a few years ago. It was noted to be a problem. There were attempts to try to steer the fisheries towards places where uh, the target species would be a little more separate from the bycatch species. But beyond that, I don't know what the, the current management situation is. But it, it is one of the, uh, the serious loopholes in terms of the management. Thank you, John. Um, I, I have a couple of questions about sort of the logistics of removing a dam um, and, and some of the stakeholders involved, specifically up upstream landowners yeah. um, who lose, uh, for example, a lake in their backyard. Um, uh, and specifically uh, the Pocatuck River in Rhode Island, um, between Rhode Island and Connecticut is an example of where those yeah. landowners were very active. Um, what, um, how do you overcome that kind of uh, concern? Yeah, in fact, this is something that George Jackman has been facing in the Hudson Valley quite often, and it's a generic problem. Um, people who have backyard docks with rowboats like their ponds. Um, I think you have to talk to them and appeal to them that uh, this they're still going to have water. They're going to get back some real estate because the water will drain downwards, uh, but they'll get back some land and they will have water amenity still. It just be flowing water rather than uh, ponded water. Uh, I think it's more important actually to get to the dam owner. Um, if the dam owner is not agreeable, then it doesn't matter what the rest of those people are thinking. And in that case, you can kind of use a, a dual approach. You can say that, number one, if your dam is to breach and cause damage downstream, you'll be liable and people could actually die. And you know, by the way, your dam's not in great condition. You might think about this. And, and, and secondly, you're gonna be an ecological hero because you're gonna bring back life to uh, an area in this river that hasn't seen it for X number of years. So I, I like the duality of that kind of approach. On the, on the pond owners, it's, it's a tough sell. I think you have to try to get the community broadly behind it, which might involve bringing in the history to people, you know, op-eds or presentations that talk about the history of the river and its potential. But it, it's a problem. It's an absolute problem. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Remy Moncrief. Uh, he's with Audubon Society. A bit earlier, you mentioned that new dams are rare. Do you know why that is? Is it because of shifting infrastructure or social factors? I think that we built a lot of the dams that we already need. Um, we've also chosen the best dam sites. You know, there are sites that just morphologically are more amenable to dams than most of them have been taken already. But so many of the dams were built for industrial reasons. You know, in the early days of this country, our power came from animals and from water. And we needed dams. Uh, to, to grind wheat and, and, and you know, various other kinds of products. Uh, nowadays, we just basically don't need dams anymore for the most part. There may be a rare case where you need to have uh, either flood control because of uh, you know, storm threats uh, or more drinking water, but we're kind of built out on dams. And we're in a phase where our dams are aging and, and need to be lifted out, not, uh, not built. I don't think we're ever gonna see any kind of upsurge in dam building. It is happening elsewhere around the world. A lot of nations are basically ready to repeat our mistakes here and build large dams in places where there's alternatives like Mongolia, a place that has endless amounts of space um, and could have, you know, could be the solar capital of the world, wanted to put dams in, in, in this one incredibly wild river that I spent time on um, that, you know, it, it would be a crime to put a dam on this river. And yet they were thinking in those terms it's one of those things that people can point to as a great accomplishment in, in these countries. Um, so it's going on worldwide, but in the US, fortunately, um, dam building has come to a near halt. Yes. Uh, I have a question from John Wright. Uh, what is the status of dam inventories in the Northeastern United States? Which states have complete inventories? I, I think that, um, Every state has an inventory. 
but what's complete or not is debatable. Um, actually, George, who I mentioned earlier, has found dams in New York State in the Hudson Valley that were not listed. So, um, you know, it wouldn't hurt if it, individuals walked every single tributary of every river and actually updated what's out there. But I think for the most part, you know, we know about the identities and circumstances of the vast majority. And, and, and that information is available state by state. Great. Um, I have a question from Steve Pierpont. How can we fund or support a specific dam removal plan that will be successful? Is someone leading or managing the one needed to be removed on Long Island? Yeah, the Peconic Estuary Trust is involved in that. And I understand that there's a bit of a, uh, it's not moving forward at the moment. Um, I think what you'd have to do is talk to the principals there and see if there's a way that you could be helpful. Um, again, every single dam removal is very idiosyncratic. And the, the places where you can jump in are not always clear, or the times you can jump in are not always clear. So I think it's a matter of, if you're interested in getting involved in this, in, in having um, someone talk to a number of dams situations that are in play and, and see if there's a way you can be helpful. Thank you. I have a question from Jackie Faust. Knowing that removing dams needs to be carefully done and considered, are there resources around to help municipalities, states, or others manage the removal of dams successfully and with the intended environmental consequences versus unintended negative ones? There are, you know, there's been a, a number of removals. So there are experienced contractors out there who know, to, know how to get heavy equipment in and, and, and know how to do this. And there are consultants. Uh, I, I, someone I wrote about in my book, uh, Laura Wildman, I think is the premier dam removal person in this country. And, and, and she can look at a dam and, and basically, you know, imagine what you'll have at the end of that when the dam is removed. Um, and she's always right on about what that river will then look like. And the thing about these rivers is that once the dam is out, they heal themselves very quickly. She took me to locations when I was interviewing her for the book where she asked me to uh, tell her where the dam was. And I couldn't figure it out because there was no remnant whatsoever. Uh, one scare tactic that people who try to preserve dams use is that they tell the public that once the dam is down, you'll see just a big um, plot of mud. And the truth is these dams actually do accumulate large amounts of soft sediment. The thing is though, that once you have the first big storm or two, that goes out to sea and you're left with a river that's healed itself. The river knows what it wants to be and it very quickly reverts back to um, a, a normal kind of river form. So if you can get the dam out with heavy equipment, basically if you trust nature, it'll heal itself. You don't have to then manicure it, um, just let it be and you'll be very happy with the results. Great, I have some comments from Jason Jarvis that may include some uh, good fodder for uh, response here, John. Uh, I'm an artisanal commercial fisherman in Rhode Island. We could be the poster child of the benefits of dam removal. The issue is Potter Hill Dam. Politics and property owners tend to outweigh common sense and the brilliant engineers that say this dam needs removal. The aging dam is a serious flood hazard, so how can we continue forward with educating people about the importance of removing dams? And then he sort of follows up on that by saying, I, I want to add that the current dam and fish ladder make it a perfect kill zone for the alewives and bluebacks that can't get above the dam and get away from the hundreds of cormorants that have, already, that have really easy pickings. The landowners need to understand the importance of the holistic ecological improvement once the dam is removed. Um, and finally, he says uh, that the saddest part is that the town has available funding for the removal. Yeah, there's a lot there. I'm vaguely aware of the situation. I've read a bit about it. Um, it is a problem where fish aggregate below dams and they become easy pickings for for predators. And it also gives a very false sense of abundance. You know, you look at the dam and you see all these fish swirling behind, below it and you think, wow, this is a great run. But that's because they can't get any further and they're just stacked up. Uh, it's, it's a very artificial impression. The key is somehow to put peer pressure on these people. Um, 
you know, you can't force them. You can't force them to give up their property and, and, uh, and, and to be in favor of this. So you have to, I think, as much as possible, use um, government and NGOs and just discussions with other people who are in, in favor to um, get that side to just basically say, okay, you're right, you know, well, let's, let's just go with it. Um, but there, there's no silver bullet um, because we don't have ultimate power. Uh, the one case where we would have ultimate power is if you can prove the dam is actually a high hazard dam. And high hazard is a term that's confused actually. When I first heard high hazard, I thought it meant uh, in poor condition. What it means is that actually, if the dam was to break, it would cause damage to people downstream. So uh, obviously, if it's in very bad condition, you have a case there for taking it down. But if it's a high hazard dam in, in, um, in poor condition, you have a stronger case because if it ruptures, it's going to kill people, wash away cars, whatever. Um, so you might look at the, uh, the dam safety question a little more intensively. I don't know the last time it was surveyed by a dam safety um, person, but maybe you should be resurveyed again soon. Great. A um, couple more questions. Thank you, John. Uh, one from Kristen Hudgens. What are your thoughts on partial dam removal, such as the Kent Dam in Ohio? I think partial dam removal, where you uh, allow easy passage of the fish, and this is sometimes called notching too. Uh, you can notch a dam and make it lower. Uh, if the fish can just swim through it without having to then figure out and brave uh, a ladder or an elevator, uh, that's fine. And what that may do actually is keep the water levels a little higher than they would be in the case of um, the breaching of the dam or the removal of the dam. And that might be beneficial. The alewives like to spawn in ponded water. So having a still somewhat ponded situation with easy passage is almost ideal from the point of view of that one species. Thank you. Question from Steve Leisman. Has anybody ever brought together dam removers from around the country to trade best practices and also create some standards for identifying the best candidates for removal? And is there any room uh, for the federal government to help local dam removers speed up their processes? There are people who are frustrated with the number of permits that have to be gained before you actually take a dam down. It's, it's a lengthy process. So it would be nice to have some kind of ombudsman situation to streamline that process. Um, now, the first part of that question was, say that again. Uh, well, let's see. I lost it. There we go. Um, best practices. Yeah. OK, so there is a. Uh, annual fish passage um, conference in this country that moves around uh, from state to state from year to year. And that brings together, you know, awful lot of talent when it comes to this, this question. So uh, I do think these people do talk to each other and they, they publish papers and results and they're out there in some cases available for hire. So there's a whole world that could be tapped into just from the engineering side that really doesn't talk that much to the ecological side, but they're out there, the expertise is there. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you. Um, do you want to try to squeeze in one, one or two more here, John? Yes. So um, John Wright has posted about the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, and their funds for removing dams. Uh, there's a link here that we can post. Um, Mary Cammy, hi, Mary. Uh, suggest also another resource called uh, on uh, Long Island River Restoration at ctuck.org river, river Revival. We'll post that as well. Um, John Portnoy uh, asks when, a rec how the recording will be available. Um, we, we will uh, somehow splice together the two <laughs> recordings that we now have and uh, circulate it to anyone who's interested. If you, uh, for some reason, are not on the mailing list because of a registration uh, complication or something, you can email me at bensonchiles at gmail.com, B-E-N-S-O-N-C-H-I-L-E-S at gmail.com. I have a question here from Jim Rogers. Uh, what is the future of a Conowindo Dam on the Susquehanna? It's very uncertain. It, uh... 
the Susquehanna has the greatest sediment load of any river on the East Coast. And that reservoir is essentially filled with sediment. So it's not serving as a, um, you know, a, much of a water trap anymore. Um, and the, the great fear about this is that if we get a major hurricane <clears throat> that scoops up a lot of that sediment, it's going to be sent right into Chesapeake Bay and undo decades of restoration work in terms of nutrient levels. Um, managers down there call that uh, anticipated event an aquapolypse. They're very afraid of that happening. So there have been attempts to dredge some of it out, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like using a thimble uh, to drain a bathtub. There's just so much there that um, it would be a massive endeavor to get rid of that sediment. And the other three dams also in that area, um, you know, sequentially have a lot of sediment too. So the future is not, is not good. Um, you, if you take the dam down, you release all that sediment. If you keep it in place, you also are not um, trapping much sediment anymore. And meanwhile, it's doing a heck of a lot of harm. So uh, uh, people have looked at ideas for this, but there seems to be no good solutions. Yes, I hear you. Um, OK, um, we. I think we have gotten through most of the questions and we have reached our, our one hour uh, luncheon timeline. Uh, John, it was great having you, great presentation. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us and, and for all of your hard work on these issues. I know that we will be in touch with you uh, and others on this call um, as we move forward, hopefully. Um, you know, folks on this call are inspired to engage on this issue. Um, you know, I think we have some some real opportunity here. And I did promise everyone that I would ask you where the hottest uh, striped bass fishing is on the East Coast today. And for those of you who stuck around to hear the answer, John, what, what would you say? It's gonna surprise a lot of people who um, actually think about striped bass. It's the Gas Bay Peninsula in Eastern Quebec the, uh, the fishing is, is beyond belief, and it's because the Miramichi River population went from about 5,000 striped bass uh, 20 years ago to over a million in recent years, and uh, they are just everywhere up there, and it's, it's, it's um, I was there a couple of times, and the fishing was phenomenal. All right, so I guess that's a positive sign for, uh, for the striped bass, um, though. <laughs> We would like more of them down in the Chesapeake Bay and, and exactly. elsewhere. Exactly. Yes, that would be nice. Um, okay, and and uh, Jacqueline Higgins, you can uh, thank you for your help. Do you want to say hello? Jacqueline is the Forage Fish uh, <clears throat> Conservation Associate for TRCP, and she's been facilitating. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> Thanks for your help. And uh, thank you again, John, for joining us. Thanks, thanks everyone. We'll keep you posted on future events. Thank you for having me. Take care. Thank you.